Welcome to the farm. It's gonna be an informative day here today. Dan Young, a University of Wisconsin professor, is coming on up to teach me about dung beetles. Now, dung beetles are, so hold on. Let me get this. Hello? Hey, it's Brady. Hey, Brady. You promised to help me out sometime. Yeah. I have a cocktail hors d'oeuvre emergency. We have friends coming for a cocktail party. Okay, well, what time? Today, four o'clock. No problem, I'll take care of it. Really, great, thank you. See you then. Okay, a little bit of a change of plans there. That was my friend Brady, and he needs help with a cocktail party this afternoon, which is a great excuse for me to go out and learn about the ingredients that are put into all of the wonderful distilled Wisconsin spirits. So I have an idea. Why don't we start out in Blue Mounds and learn about growing potatoes? And then we'll head up to learn about sorghum for making whiskey. And on the way back, I'm gonna stop in and get some lefsa for some appetizers. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inka Witcher. Gather with us around the farm table. A few years ago, I moved up to Wisconsin. I started an organic dairy farm at St. Isidore's Mead. That's when I discovered the abundance of Midwestern local food and small scale farmers. Growing everything from green zebra tomatoes to pasture pork. I'm taking a break from the cows, hitting the road, and seeing if I can't satisfy my epicurious appetite. Oh. That's crazy. This is amazing. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. So Dan, I wanted to have you out to the farm. I'm interested in the beetles, specifically the dung beetles, and find out what they bring to the farm and why they're important to have in nature. Sure. Um, dung beetles are, are within a group of beetles that are very important recyclers. Um, a lot of people think of positive things on a farm with insects related largely to pollination, and that's certainly true, but uh, an incredibly important ecological service that insects provide, and, and dung beetles is a good example, is nutrient recycling. And certainly when you have dung pads like this around, it's, it's important for this material to get recycled back into the soil to build the soil, and also to get it off from the surface of the soil where you would tend to have an increase in nuisance flies if, if it was sitting out here for a while. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of things that dung beetles are gonna do to help you. What kind of species would I expect to find here at my farm? We have, within the family that this group belongs to, there are probably about 165 species of scarab beetles that, that live in Wisconsin. Mm. And a fairly important subset of those would be ones that are associated with dung. So the beetles are really important for me on my farm just to help with uh, recycling the manure. How do I encourage them? Is there something that I can be doing or is there something that I, sh uh, you know, obviously I'm not spraying any pesticides because I'm an organic farm, but should I just, the, the work's all done? I think as long as you have a situation like this where you have a reasonably undisturbed setting uh, with the way the fields are managed, you're, you're basically, um, the beetles will take care of themselves. You can certainly see the flies are doing that. Their sense of smell, as it were, the chemical receptors in their antennae are really, really fine and you can draw things in from literally miles away if you have a good foundation for them to receive. Well, I appreciate you coming out to the farm and teaching me about this interesting subject. Well, you're welcome. Well, I tell you what, I wanted to get some Wisconsin distilled liquor for this party this afternoon, and I wanted to find out about the ingredients that go into it. So let's head on down to Blue Mounds and find out about growing seed potatoes. today. Oh, Inga. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I've been wanting to visit here for quite a while. This farm has been around since when? 90, 1994. No kidding. We started this farm and our first CSA season was 95. And you guys must have been one of the first CSAs in Wisconsin. 
This is our 22nd season as a CSA. Yeah, we started Vermont Valley Community Farm when there's, oh, maybe about a dozen farms in the whole state going on at the very beginning of the whole CSA movement. Was it difficult to educate people about what a CSA is or to bring people aboard uh, with the idea? It took a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort because people didn't know what CSA was. It wasn't even close to being a household word. So yeah, we really kind of beat the pavement educating people. Well, wonderful. And your kids work with you. That's something that I just love seeing is the adult children staying on the farm. We have three kids. Jesse works with us. He's our oldest. Our son Eric works with us. Our daughter Becky works with us. And our daughter-in-law, Jana, works with us. That's really wonderful. I love hearing about that. I live nearby and I'll work on the farm. Nice. Well, I'm hoping to find out about potatoes. Is Jesse around, I'm hoping, today? Oh, we he? keep him working in the potato field. So that's where you're going to find him. I think he's him. out in that field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's All right. hilling potatoes today. <laughs> well, I'll let you guys get back to it. It was nice to see you. I'm picking up some potato vodka today to make cocktails with, and I realize I don't know enough about the potato industry here in Wisconsin. Now, here on your farm, you're mostly a seed potato producer, is that right? Yeah, but almost all our potatoes go to the, um, for the seed potato business. We deliver quite a few potatoes to the CSA, but other than that, all the potatoes we sell are as seed. So what's the difference between a regular potato and a seed potato? The only difference, especially for organic potato, is that the seed potato goes through extra sets of testing to make sure it's disease-free, otherwise it's the exact same as the potato you would buy in the store. Now I noticed you were uh, hilling your potatoes, and I do the same thing at my house. It, but what's the reasoning behind it? It's, is it to grow more potatoes? The main reason we hill is for weed control. When we plant the potatoes, our planter hills them up, and then we knock that hill down for weed control, then as they get bigger, we continue to hill them up. So it's for weed control, but it's also to make sure that the potatoes themselves are covered by dirt, so there's no greening or sure. um, the animal, nothing, no rodent damage or bird damage. So. so if I wanted to save some of my potatoes this year for seed potatoes for next year, what are some tips on some, how to make it them last? Um, we like to we store our potatoes at um, in cold, dark, and high humidity. We like to store them at 38 degrees and very high humidity and as dark as you can possibly make it. So to make sure they don't start growing, they go into dormancy, then they have to break the dormancy in the spring in order to grow. So you need to warm them back up in the spring before you plant them. Well, I tell you what, all this talk about potatoes is making me hungry for some lefsa. So why don't we take off to Blair and let Jesse get back to cultivating. I'm at Countryside Left Side here in Blair, Wisconsin. I wanted to find out how potatoes are used to make one of my favorite things. So, Darlene, you've been making Left Side for quite a few years, right? Quite a few. How long have you been here? Almost 30 years. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. Yep. So what is, how do you make good Left Side? Well, by the time I get it, it's already into these nice, either the pucks or the balls. Yeah. And then you just... Do you want to, you don't want to uh, overflower it though, right? No, you don't. Just a little bit of flour. It looks like we're using a lot. Yeah. But you'll see as it gets baked, a lot of this is going to fall off. So when it gets onto the cloths over there, you won't see very much of the flour. Yeah. I feel kind of terrible that with a name like Inga that I don't make lefsa more often. <laughs> but <laughs> when there's ladies like you that make great lefsa. Well, thank you. We try. <laughs> And our goal here is to get between a 17 and an 18, 19 inch circle. That's huge. Before we transfer it to a baker. Now you all still use the sticks. Is that just, yes. it's so much easier to handle it with sticks? Well, it's almost impossible to hand it any, handle it any other way because it's so thin, your fingers would go right through it if you tried to pick it up with your okay. hands. Now you just swing it out, drop it, and then roll it off your stick. Go, 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 go. You did good for the first time. <laughs> Thank you so much. And keep up what you're doing. We will try. <laughs> Let's go say hi to Marshall. Hi. Seeing lefsa made like this is really incredible. It's just, it smells so great in here and I love the atmosphere. Tell me a little bit about your business. Um, this is a business that's been around for 50 years. Um, we started making lefsa in a drive-in in 1965 and now um, it slowly has grown and now um, we are here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that uh, Blair, Wisconsin is almost kind of known for uh, your guys' lefsa here, right? 
I mean, that's what I always think of when I think of Blair. Yep, we get um, in the fall especially, but even this time of year, we get people that'll come and drive for three hours to get Lefsa. They make it kind of a day. Well, I'm Norwegian. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our heritage, yep, <laughs> yep. The Norwegians were kind of cheap, so they didn't want to waste the potatoes. So they were kind of? Yeah. <laughs> Don't waste the potato after you boiled it, so they made it into something the next day, and that's where it kind of came from. So, yeah, they were kind of cheap. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's nice being here to see the process because I feel like I'm in the kitchen with my grandmothers and my aunts and my friends making lefsa, and I like that the business is... Uh, you know, several women doing their thing and making this incredible product. What do you think about that? Yeah, we, we do it just like they did in the home, um, even, just on a bigger scale. Uh -huh. And left so there's not a lot of ingredients in it, but it's very tricky to do the process. So we have potatoes in the back, about 60,000 pounds, and we peel and cook those. And then they come out here and they mix them, and then they're rolling them baking them on open grills, which are, it gets hot in here, and then they package them. So it's a uh, handmade, handmade product. And when you try to change that, it gets dry. Uh -huh. So conveyor ovens, not good. Machines, not good. Instant potatoes, not good for Lefsa. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm doing a Wisconsin-themed cocktail party for a friend of mine, and it wouldn't be Wisconsin-themed unless I brought some Lefsa. So I came to pick up some Lefsa for my little hors d'oeuvres. Wonderful. Yep. Roll them up and then cut them into little pieces. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to finish up here and then gather some extra ingredients, and then we'll get headed to the kitchen. I'm headed out to Sheboygan County to learn about the sorghum grown here in Wisconsin. Rich Whittle is one of the largest sorghum producers here, and part of his sorghum goes into making a craft whiskey, which I'll pick up later for our cocktails. Let's go say hi to Rich. Boy, it's nice when I'm going through Wisconsin, seeing cornfields after cornfields, to all of a sudden see a sorghum field. You don't see that many in Wisconsin. How many farms are there? There are very few farms producing sorghum in Wisconsin at this time. Uh, there's a uh, few people that are doing it as a hobbyist, but most of them are very small. So by small, is that like But we're saying acres, an or? acre or less. An acre or less. A lot of times they may have three 50-foot rows in their garden. That's very small. Yes. <laughs> so how, wh how many acres are you doing? We actually have 30. Uh, that's somewhere between 1% and 2% of the nation's crop. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you've really kind of helped pioneer sorghum here in, in Wisconsin. Is it was it always grown in Wisconsin, or is this sorghum has been grown in the United States since about 1853? Uh, what we see happening is the fact that they were trying to start a northern sugar industry. So Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota played a very important part of that. In 1879, the state of Wisconsin produced 325,000 gallons of syrup. I, I always think of sorghum as being a southern crop mm -hmm. and Wisconsin being a dairy state. <laughs> so it's interesting to know that. Tennessee and Kentucky are really the heart of it with North Carolina having probably the most producers in the nation. How did you come to do sorghum for a crop to sell? Uh, we started farming full time in the fall of 84 and uh, 88 we had a major drought here in Wisconsin. We virtually lost all of our crops and all of our custom work. Mm -hmm. And we had been playing with sorghum for, what, three years then already. And uh, because of the debt that we had from the drought, uh, we just were never going to pay the debt off doing what sure. everybody else was doing. And therefore, I looked at something alternative. That's really exciting. And so we just kept playing with it. What do you harvest off of the plant? I'm, I'm only kind of vaguely familiar with the sorghum that I would graze my cows on. So tell me, what does it look like when you're harvesting? What we're after is the juice that's in the stock. And so what we normally do is we'll go in and we'll cut the heads off, and then we'll harvest the stock, squeeze the juice out of it, and then the juice you cook down like you would maple syrup set. And takes is it about, about the same ratio? 10 gallons of uh, juice to make a gallon of syrup, where maple syrup takes roughly 40 to 1. Oh, wow. Huge mm -hmm. difference. Yeah. Uh, we cook to a thicker syrup, a heavier syrup. It will be similar to a honey or molasses in consistency when we're done. And I'm not really familiar with it. So, like, what does it look like? Can we just maybe taste some yeah, of yours? Yeah, we have a jar here. And this is, you just replace this like you would molasses in your cooking? Yes, or for the honey or any other sweetener that you might okay. want. 
So this is that sort of rich amber color that you're looking for? Yes. Does it vary from year to year at all? It can vary from farm to farm, also based on the uh, weather and on the soil conditions. Okay. I've seen uh, sorghum that looked as light as clear honey, and I've seen what we call road tar. Some people really mess it up. <laughs> road tar, this is really good. It does kind of have, it's a nicer flavor than molasses, but it reminds me of that molasses flavor. It's a very mild like molasses dirt. flavor and it won't bite your back. Yeah. 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 It's also got just about the same nutritional value as molasses, a very high in iron, calcium, potassium, and the antioxidants. Okay. And because of the sugar makeup, uh, most diabetics will absorb it much slower than they would either maple syrup or honey. I'm helping do cocktails and hors d'oeuvres for a cocktail party this afternoon, and I'm going to be picking up some whiskey that's made with your sorghum. What other products do you do with your sorghum? What happens with your syrup? First of all, we sell a lot of it at farm markets. Uh, we do a couple of big farm markets year-round, and we also have a lot of store accounts. But uh, in the last few years, we've had several distilleries come to us, and they actually make whiskey from it. Uh, we have people making other products, some of which are going overseas. Uh, we ourselves actually make caramel popcorn with it. Oh, I love caramel popcorn. I might have to grab some of that too <laughs> to snack on while I'm making cocktails. Well, I'm going to head on over to Old Sugar Distillery to pick up some whiskey made with Rich's sorghum. And then why don't you all meet me back at Brady's house where we'll make up some craft cocktails and some lefts that were d'oeuvres. <laughs> Well, I'm a heck of a lot better at drinking cocktails than making cocktails. And that's why I wanted to invite my friend, Chef Nathan Berg, he's the chef at the Lakely here in Eau Claire, up to Brady's house to help me put on this little cocktail party. He loves Midwestern cooking and he really celebrates it in, in what he does. Nathan, what is that Midwest cuisine? Yeah, to me it represents, you know, everything that's available here that people can grow locally. Um, and, you know, the things that are well suited to our area here in Wisconsin, we're known for, you know, our dairy production, so lots of cheese and butter and the like. But it also, to me, means some of the ingredients that are native to this region, uh, the things that the Native Americans in this area utilized well before the white settlers came here. So like that's a lot of... What ingredients are those? So that would be like a lot of wild rice and okay. maple syrup and cranberries and, and venison and freshwater fish, you know, th those type of things. So I think when you uh, kind of combine them as a whole, that uh, that really represents all the different cultures that have kind of settled here in our area. Well, we're going to make some uh, hors d'oeuvres today that I always think of as very Midwestern, which is lefsa. And lefsa is, of course, Norwegian, but I feel like we eat plenty here in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, that again comes from the, the Scandinavian, Scandinavian heritage. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Norwegian myself, so my grandmother, you know, taught me how to make lefsa. And so, you know, so many other people around here eat it as well. So I like to do, you know, a lot of the traditional Scandinavians will just do butter on their on their lefse, but I've actually found that I really enjoy cooking with it as well and mixing other ingredients and, and making some fun things out of it. So I thought that's what we'd do here. First we're gonna make one that just has some fresh breakfast radishes and some butter on it. So um, I'm gonna chop a few of the radishes here and then we will uh, we'll get started on constructing it. You know, I like using simple ingredients like this. When you have fresh radishes out of your garden and wonderful fresh butter, it's really delicious and you don't have to go over the top when you're cooking to have really incredible food and memorable food. When you're cooking, I always say with fresh ingredients, things always turn out so much nicer. So then if you want to grab a plate there and then we can unwrap the piece of lefse and we're just gonna spread a nice even layer of this uh, farm fresh butter on here. Okay, and then we're just gonna spread a, a little of the fresh radish on there. And you're right, this is such a, a simple thing, but so flavorful. I love fresh radishes, I think they're incredible. Okay, and so then we're just gonna roll this up. Hey, do you wanna roll that I can do it for you, okay, yeah. great. And nice and tight, right? Yep, nice and tight, and then uh, we'll just cut it up here in a little bit. We'll build the next one here. We're gonna use some smoked trout from our local trout farm. I'm just gonna roll that up inside of the left side. So if you wanna grab another plate, we'll do that. And then once that one's cut, we're gonna to top it with some uh, horseradish creme fraiche. I love it that we can use trout instead of a traditional salmon. You see a lot of salmon with these kinds of uh, creamier dressings. Uh, but we have trout right down the road, so why not use it, right? Yeah, exactly. A lot of times you see the salmon because that's you know, something that they use a lot in Scandinavia because they have so much salmon around them. But, you know, here we have trout. Okay. And I, I, again, I, I think it's nice to, especially when you're throwing a party, 
not to have to get stressed out about making something that's so over the top. Having a nice simple recipe like this yeah, exactly. and really easy. I mean, these, could, these couldn't be any simpler. And then for this last one, uh, we're going to actually be heating it in the oven. So yeah, the, the pan the would be helpful freezer. there. I'm going to just lay out some of the pieces of ham on here. Okay. And then I'm gonna top it with the Gruyere cheese. Okay. And then this is just gonna get broiled for about a minute, just enough to melt the cheese a little bit and kind of warm it up. And then um, this is a great, uh, especially because of the potato that's in the left. So the potato and the ham and the cheese are just It's a, like Easter. Exactly, it's like, a, it's like a perfect Easter dinner all wrapped into one little piece of left. So and then this one is just gonna go under the broiler for a minute so that we can melt the cheese. And then uh, we'll just roll it up and cut it after that. Okay, well, I'm just gonna get these guys finished and get cleaned up and then we'll start making some cocktails. Well, the gang's all here, so let's get some drinks started and so I can get started serving. Okay, sounds good. Which is first? Um, first, I'm gonna make something with the sorghum whiskey here, and we're gonna we're gonna combine some sorghum whiskey and apple brandy. Okay, I love it that we have that we can turn sorghum into whiskey, and we have all these wonderful ingredients here in the Midwest that we and I talk about it all the time, but I think it's great. I think it's great to live somewhere and to eat from that place, but. Most importantly, you can also drink from the, that place. Yeah. Which is kind of fantastic. Oh, it's, it's really great. I mean, you know, it was nice to see there was the craft beer movement that really started, you know, um, springing up locally. And, and, and now it's nice to see that we can, uh, we can get all of these different uh, liquors made out of local grains and sugars and, and all that. It's, it's kind of the next step, right? <laughs> okay, so the apple brandy and the queen genie. Yep, and now I'm going to add a little bit of fresh local cream. Okay, now the queen genie, that was named after a uh, lady that lived in Madison during the Prohibition, and she was a bootlegger. Oh, I did not and know this. Was queen genie, and she had a speakeasy. <laughs> Excellent. I know. That's very cool, I've never heard that story. Entrepreneur, yeah. Okay, maple syrup. Yep, and then a little bit of maple syrup to finish it off. And then what I'm gonna do is dry shake this, which means to shake it without ice, just because it's nice, um, that cream is kinda in there to give it a little bit of levity, and so to shake it a little bit first is, is a little helpful. So. Okay. I kinda wanna take a sip, but I feel like I should I save it I think you should probably guests. serve it for the guests, yeah. <laughs> well listen, I'm gonna go serve these. Why don't we get started on the next cocktail? Okay, sounds great. We're gonna use the potato vodka in here, and then basically the, the accents here are gonna be strawberry and mint with a little balsamic vinegar. So, so first thing I'm gonna do is muddle some, uh, like three leaves of mint in here with a little bit of simple syrup. And when you muddle, you just, you're just releasing that essential oil, basically? Yeah, exactly. I mean, some people think that muddle means crush, um, and they just kind of destroy the leaves in there, and really the That's idea... That's what I do. <laughs> and really the idea is just to, just to press it slightly to kind of bring out the, the oils that are inside the, uh, whatever herb it is that you're doing, in this case, mint. And mint can be very overpowering, as you know, so this is a nice way to incorporate it in a drink. Exactly, exactly. So then um, we're going to add some of the, uh, some of the vodka. And then we're gonna finish it off with some of the strawberry balsamic shrub that I made. Now tell me, what is a shrub? So a shrub is basically just a um, kind of a sweet and sour concoction that... Uh, vinegary, is that right? Yeah, it's usually made with some kind of fruit puree or juice and some form of vinegar. So in this case, I did uh, strawberry puree and then mixed it with some balsamic vinegar. I love Nathan, he, he takes things very seriously. He's, just goes out in the garden and makes shrubs for these craft cocktails. I love it. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, it's a good way to incorporate some local seasonal flavors into your drinks instead of just always relying on citrus fruit that are always in the grocery stores all year round. For you know? sure, yeah. Um, we're gonna do this in the, in the tall skinny glass there, if you wanna fill that with some ice. And I'm just gonna double strain this one to make sure that we don't have pieces of mint in there. Well, I got a straw for this one. Okay, great. I'm gonna cut a little strawberry here for some garnish too to make it look prettier. I think garnish is important for drinks. Oh, it totally is, you know? Just like they say that you eat with your eyes first, you also kind of drink with your eyes first. So if it looks appetizing, it'll taste more appetizing. Absolutely. This is a fun one. Um, it's kind of a twist on a, uh, on a Manhattan, except it has almost none of the ingredients of a Manhattan, <laughs> but it's, it's made in kind of the same style. Um, Manhattan is typically um, made with rye and vermouth 
and um, brandy cherry. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, we're not using really any of those specific ingredients, but it still ends up kind of being the same type of thing. This is a nice local rum made right here in Wisconsin. And then in place of the vermouth, I'm actually going to use some mead from a uh, from a local mead producer. And what is mead? That's just a honey wine. Yeah, yeah, it's fermented like a wine made made out of honey. Um, there's a there's a place here in Wisconsin that's uh, White Winter Winery that's been making it for uh, 20 years now, and they make all different um, styles. This particular one that I'm using is their their black mead, which is made with blackberry. It's a pretty color. Yeah, and it's kind of got the sweet and sour mix of a, of a vermouth as right. well, so, so it works very well with that. And then just for a little bit of extra, extra tart and sweet, I'm going to use this wild plum grenadine, and then um, just, a, just a hair of simple syrup as well, just to... Balance out the cocktail. Yep, and then for the last part here, I'm actually going to use some bitters, booze-soaked blackberries to kind of top it all off. Well, let's get these on a tray and let's get everything served. Lefsa hors d'oeuvres, not your grandfather's Lefsa and Ludafisk. Try a tasty tipple of Wisconsin's new and creative distilleries. <laughs> well, I hope this has inspired you to drink local, and I hope that you'll gather with us next time around, around the, the farm, farm table. table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television.